All right. Hello. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, yeah, I, I, I've had the great good fortune. Oh, good. Thank you. I see, I hear, see my audio is working. I've had the great good fortune of spending the winter uh, getting to go through the chart collection up at uh, Penobscot Marine Museum and sorting through approximately 3,500 charts to help update the museum's inventory uh, records and update the computer system, and also to flag out items of interest to potentially be used to help the museum tell stories in future exhibits and to help other researchers who want to come and track down stories. And in the process, I've uh, I've just fallen in love with so many of the charts because they're they're more than just maps and old pieces of paper. There's so much so much traces of what they've gone through. So many traces of what they've gone through. So many personal touches. It's uh, there's a lot of material in these charts more than just what their paper value would suggest. And uh, as far as coming into this project, like Gina said, I've worked on a whole bunch of boats, so I've I've handled a lot of charts over the years. Uh, and tracking charts over time has been sort of a hobby of mine when uh, on image one here, I, my first time at sea, I was on a large brigantine, the Corwith Kramer. Can we go to the next slide? I was on a big brigantine with Sea Education Association and we were down in the Caribbean. And as we were approaching the Caribbean, we had to send people aloft as we were making landfall to keep an eye out for coral heads because the charts we were using had not been updated since the British surveys of the 1840s. So the coral heads had had time to grow in the intervening hundred years. So I've, I've had a personal experience with the sort of the, the range of time periods charts can cover. But the first thing I really noticed when I got into the chart collection in image two here is just the sheer artwork that went into these things. There, the, most of us are familiar with standard modern maps. It has government information, such like that. But a lot of these 19th century charts are works of art in their own right. You can see here, we've got half a dozen different fonts. We've got some very elaborate calligraphy. And this is all being done by hand. This is an 1825 English chart. And this is really standard for a lot of the charts I was handling. A lot of these 19th century charts are quite elaborate when they don't have to be. And that's just been a, a, a delightful little bit of uh, artistic whimsy that didn't have to get included, but it's made every chart fun. <laughs> yes, only the most authentic. And the other thing is just seeing even the fonts themselves, the title bars, if you zoom in on the, on the B in Bahamas here, this, is, this letter is only about an inch across on the actual map, but they carefully did all that cross hatching and shading. So it's just really interesting to see an era when all this craftsmanship was being done by hand on these charts, uh, creating these engraving plates that were then sent around the world. And sometimes these charts really were packing in the information. Here, you've kind of got the entire grab bag of what that cartography team wanted you to know. We have the title, we have who sponsored the chart, but we also have right in the middle there, three different scales for mileage, because it's not standardized at that point in the, in the mid 19th century. So you've got French and English miles, they're sharing a measurement system, but the Dutch are using a different system and the Swedes are using still a third system. So if you're some poor mariner making your way off the coast of, of England, you better hope that your chart has the, right, uh, has the right measurement system for what you're used to. And the other thing you can see on this one, those landscapes uh, in the era before accurate standardized cartography and your radar and your GPS systems and all that, sometimes just knowing what a chart looked like could help you figure out if you were off if you were off London or if you were off Cornwall, you could sort of get an idea by these little drawings included on the charts to sort of give, give you your, your best guess for what where you were. And as part of tracking these charts, you see how our own knowledge of the landscape changes as more and more people go through an area and write down what they see. This was the earliest chart I encountered in the Penobscot Marine Museum collections. It's a Dutch chart uh, from 1687 of New England, but you'll notice it looks way different from what we're used to seeing in New England. Uh, this is sort of zoomed into the upper half of like Boston to uh, the mid coast main area. And yeah, if you look close, you can see Cape Ann sort of is that little promontory sticking out. Boston is the center of the center of the uh, lines there on the bottom left. 
But overall, it's kind of a best guess cartography. It's not terribly precise. I don't know if you've ever done any sailing, but uh, I'd want a slightly more precise chart if I were gonna be approaching say Penobscot Bay. Here we see the Kennebec River, the Sheepscot River, a whole bunch of familiar names, but the landscape doesn't look terribly familiar because they were still getting the, they were still getting the knowledge down. If you go to the next chart, we're looking at another really early one here. This one dates between 1775 and 1800. And this is a uh, muscle, this is, you can see the Muscle Ridge and Owl's Head Bay. So if you go up towards the top of the screen here, we're looking at Owl's Head Islands and Owl's Head Bay, which is now Rockland, Rockland, Maine, the Owl's Head Lighthouse. But you'll notice Rockland's not there because it didn't exist yet. The town of Rockland doesn't, uh, get settled and for a few de decades later and it doesn't become its own town until the 1840s. So it's kind of neat to been looking at areas with which I'm quite familiar, but the places aren't there yet on the European maps. And uh, in other cases, the landscapes themselves are changing. It's not the maps. For instance, Boston, you can see this is Boston in 1872. And I want you to look at all the mud flats you're seeing there, that a lot of downtown Boston is infill. You can see right up East Boston has a big chunk taken out of it there where it's still all estuaries. This is the 1870s and they're starting to fill in a lot of the bay to make landscape. So if you look at the next slide, just only 25 years later, uh, they've already filled in a bunch of Boston, including at the top of the screen there, that estuary that I pointed out in East Boston now has dotted lines through it showing where they were starting to fill in and had laid out prospective new roads. So this chart was out of date as it was being published because parts of the ocean were being reclaimed to turn into parts of downtown Boston. So it's been really nifty to see how these landscapes themselves have changed and how precise some of these drawings are. And then as, as European and American uh, mariners were moving around the world, they were encountering areas which they'd never seen before and for which they had no maps. And it's kind of funny in sort of a sardonic way to see the early contact maps where the, Euro where the, where the people who are writing the maps are not necessarily talking to the locals about what they call things, or in, but instead are assigning their own names to things. In this case, you can assume it was an American who decided that the other part of Yokohama Bay in Japan should actually be called Mississippi Bay. Uh, that name didn't stick because the people who lived there pointed out they had a perfectly good name for it right there, Nigisi, not Mississippi Bay. <laughs> but it's been kind of funny to see these place names scattered all over the world, uh, completely out of context, because European and American mariners were sort of naming things after their own hometowns or their own sponsors or whatever uh, piece of home they wanted to commemorate in a South Pacific island. And on the next one, you can really see it sort of on a, on a darker scale uh, on a lot of the South American and African charts. This here is the coast of Guiana and you can see it's been parceled out. It's already, it's British Guiana, it's Dutch Guiana, it is uh, French Guiana. Uh, the, whole, the whole coast of Guiana has been labeled, has been split up as colonies. And so that's been, that's been sort of a darker side of how, the, how the, these maps enables the transfer of people and ideas across continents and oceans. And uh, this one here is a little hard to see, but it's a, it's a mid to late 19th century chart of the island of Taiwan. And I thought this chart was particularly interesting because it has way more detail than I usually see. For instance, it gives the indigenous tribes, the people who are living on this island, you can, you can see yeah, the Butang tribes up at the top, the Bantan tribes, the Soama High tribes really interesting to see indigenous people being given their own place, uh, their own point, their own place on the map that their homelands are being shown. But there's also sort of a darker side to this because you can also see they're listing what resources are there to trade for, sugar growing region. Um, further up the map, you see things labeled like poultry growing country. You see sugarcane, tobacco, indigo, camphor, these things that a, a, a potential mariner who was heading around Taiwan and maybe needed to fill his hold could come ashore and he would know what who the peoples were there but also what he could be getting there so it's uh it's it's interesting but it's also got sort of a it, it's sort of the rise of globalism really which has been really neat to see that knowledge be filtered through the chart collection and on the next one 
Yeah, <laughs> this is one of my favorites because the early, um, actually, as someone pointed out in a comment a little while ago, latitude and longitude were uh, not always the most precise when you're dealing with star sites and the lack of an accurate chronometer to know your position accurately at sea. So sometimes if you were one of the survey ships out there recording what was where, you might not always get it right or your measurements not all, might not always line up with the next vessel to come through and take surveys. And here is a really good example. This is a, a investigator's shoal off Malaysia. And you can see every practically every single reef there is labeled position uncertain. So uh, if you were a sea captain going through there, you would probably just avoid the region or have people paying a really close eye because every single position recorded there may or may not be accurate, which is part of the perils of exploring an area that is new to, uh, to your maritime community. And you also see, uh, you also see the cartographers fighting on the maps, which I thought was a delightfully little piece, uh, a delightful piece of sort of human, human nature. You can tell whether it's a British or an American cartographer sometimes by what they want to name things. For instance, this Victoria Bank here, it's called Montague Bank in 1813, but it's also called Congress Bank and John Adams Bank. So you can see that you had a couple different editions of the maps going through and various uh, cartographers are, or hydrographers are fighting for which, which country gets the credit and the glory for these names of some random little cement out in the middle of nowhere. And just like we were talking about in Boston, sometimes the landscape itself changes very dramatically. Um, many people have heard of the, volcan the volcano Krakatoa, which exploded dramatically in 1883. And in this case here, you can see where a prudent mariner has gone through with a red pen and relabeled the aftermath of this volcanic explosion. You can see the red dotted line indicates the present shape of the island of Krakatoa. The entire middle part of that island just blew up into the sea when the volcano erupted. And some of those islands, yeah, you can see a little to the top of the screen there, Kalmyer Island now underwater. The passage between the other islands is dangerous. And yeah, danger is continually changing. And even up at the very top of the screen, the tsunami from that volcano washed away the coastlines of surrounding islands. So up in the top there, Lagundi Island, coastlines somewhat changed. So these prudent mariners would be paying attention to uh, the experiences of other sailors and captains who had gone ahead of them and maybe explain what were the sort of share information about where were good routes to go through, what charts could be relied on and what charts you might not wanna trust at face value and what charts you just needed to take, to take a pen to to fix for the next time you were gonna go through. And I, I've got another sort of story of my own on this one because I was sort of tickled to see this late 19th century image of Montserrat in the Caribbean. And uh, just like I said at the beginning of the talk, I spent some time on a big brigantine and we sailed by Montserrat and down in the bottom left there, you see the town of Plymouth, uh, right by the Soufriere Hills. Problem is uh, the Soufriere Hills are volcanic. And so when I sailed by there in about 2004 or so, the entire town of Plymouth was gone. That volcano had erupted in the intervening hundred years. And, uh, the and we actually passed by close enough on the ship I was on that we could take binoculars and look at the, the cold lava uh, through the ruined buildings. And there's a, the next image there is uh, the church in Montserrat just for, imagery of what what that looks like when a volcano takes out a town so i can only imagine how dramatic it was for the people uh, writing about krakatoa or the people who saw montserrat go so it was sort of interesting to see krakatoa and then realize i'd seen charts that needed to be updated because of subsequent volcanoes and in addition to volcanoes it's it's also been interesting er, volcanoes yeah, sorry it's also been interesting to see areas that I recognize in the charts for other reasons, like Nagasaki, for anybody who's even passingly familiar with World War II history, seeing Nagasaki in the 19th century before it got uh, hit by an atomic bomb in 1945. Sort of interesting to see, it's really it looks sort of put a chill up my back to see that. Or the next one, you see a lot of South Pacific charts that have often been flagged for decades later to watch out for loose mines that all these sea minefields do not go away immediately. They have to be cleared. And often when mines break free, they can drift around. So this chart here was actually uh, 
from like the late 1950s and they were still posting warnings to mariners for, uh, they, they claim it's safe for surface navigation, but any action might disturb the mines on the bottom. I don't know about you, but I think I'd go around. And uh, you also, in addition to mines, this is Corregidor, another World War II battle site. This chart was taken in the 1950s or so. And uh, you can see there's still, the whole island is still covered with debris of World War II. You've got the whole bay and a whole bunch of the beaches are still fouled with wrecks of all the landing craft and the vessels that were destroyed in that action. So again, kind of interesting to see how time plays out and how human, how, how, how human interaction has changed these places and how we've recorded it. And more, even more timely, just actually one of the last charts I handled just the other day, was uh, this next one here. It was like an 1840s chart of the Black Sea. And then I looked close and right underneath the D at the top left there, the top left of the screen, like under my pinky finger in that photo is Mariupol. This is uh, in Ukraine. This, this, is, uh, this is the coast of Ukraine, which has been in the paper so much these days, the city of Mariupol currently besieged. So it was sort of, it was interesting and eerie to see a chart from the 1840s talking about a place that we're talking about right now on the news. But in addition to all these printed details and these captains updating their charts, you also see captains using them as sort of visual diaries of all the tracks they're taking, especially on these large scale charts. You'll see captains listing the vessels they were on. They'll often list weather conditions. They might list to and from what ports they're going to, how many days out they are from the last port. Um, Excuse me. So they're really a fascinating sort of visual snapshot of what was going on on board these vessels. Here we see R.R. Thomas, it's the name of the ship, but you also see they're recording light airs or above it, North Gale. So there's a lot of data here, especially if you've got access to a logbook. And yeah, this is really neat. That sort of crazy swirl there you see in the middle of the screen. When you see that, it's usually a hurricane. It's often a hurricane or a typhoon or a period of bad weather where they get just whacked around for a bit until they can finally straighten out their course when the storm passes and then the track resumes. So that's been really interesting uh, to sort of see where, where vessels were off the coast of Hatteras or if they were out in the Pacific and got typhoons to sort of see where and what time of year these vessels are encountering these storms. There's, there's meteorological data to be teased out of here over 200 years. So that's uh, a really neat baseline of, of material to draw from. And in addition to like the serious notes, you also see a lot, or I also <laughs> see a lot of these sort of sarcastic comments that were not necessarily meant for anybody else to see. It's just somebody writing on their own papers. For instance, this, this image of the Western Pacific, you've got somebody who's comparing their navigation with the captains and discovering there's some discrepancies. And he has written, there's 116 miles can't account for. It must be current or the captain is drunk because surely his math is not off. So uh, it's just funny to see these little personal notes that even 200 years later, you can, or, or 100 years later, you can sort of see the humanity in these people. And uh, actually there's another hurricane one here. This one, there's definitely a story here. This is an 1860s chart of the Caribbean and we're looking at the cruise track of the brig Herman who was heading from Pensacola to Aspinwall, Panama in October of 1886. And the vessel goes smack into a hurricane off the eastern, uh, western end of Cuba and was dismasted at 4 a.m. on October 8th. And you can see the note there right next to that, the focus of the hurricane passed ship Friday the 8th at 12 o'clock, wind changed in 20 minutes from northeast to southwest. And then they drifted for three days towards the coast of Cuba before being picked up by, on October 11th by the Italian bark Amadeo of Genoa with Captain G.B. Caprero. So it's neat to just see in just a few lines of text, you can, you can really see there's an entire story here of several days of hardship at sea, not being sure if they were gonna be picked up. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of story in these charts if you just know how to look for it. And then you also, in addition to the serious notes, uh, you've also just got artwork, you've got practical bits. Uh, yeah, this is one of three or four ship designs I found drawn on the back of the charts. And it's, it's hard to tell sometimes if they are any specific vessel or if it's just somebody's sort of idea of, of a vessel. But this one here is neat because it has sort of a log entry on the side of Sunday, June 21st, 1880. Uh, 10 days out from New York, wind southwest fresh, 
fleet of 14 sail off Hatteras for the last five days. So, which also sets the, the maritime nostalgia person in me very, <laughs> very, very fondly daydreaming of the ideas when you could be in company with 14 sail off Hatteras for five days. That's a sight that most of us aren't gonna get to see. But when they're going, but when they're going well like that, you could have a whole bunch of vessels clustered together. But you also see people complaining that they're really not moving, like whoever drew this little anonymous doodle, the bark S.E. Kingsbury bound to Monrovia. She don't go much. <laughs> That's clearly not thinking that, uh, not, not making enough speed. So I don't know if the tug drawn in there is wishful thinking or what, because that little tugboat with, their, with the bark under sail. So perhaps they were hoping that a tug would have gotten them there faster. But once you start seeing a bunch of these different doodles and drawings, you can get a feel for the handwriting and start seeing patterns and trends. And then from there, I was sort of surprised to realize I could get a feel for the various captains. I could start to see distinct handwriting differences and sort of keep track of who was writing what. This one here was one of the very distinctive ones. A.E. Raleigh up at the top there has a very distinctive hand. You can see Atlantic coast from Isla Ho to Cape Cod. And I don't know if he had a bad pen, if he was dyslexic, if he perhaps had a hand injury, but he often struggled with writing because there's a whole bunch of charts with the same sort of crabbed writing. He clearly had difficulty with that. But while he may not have been a secretary, he was a very good captain. And he was, uh, he was hired by the Eastern Steamship Company to run their fast passenger steamer Belfast from Midcoast, Maine to Boston for 20 years. And they, he was in charge of her on her final voyage in 1935 when they discontinued the service because the competition from automobiles had gotten too strong. Uh, so A.E. Raleigh had a very poignant piece in the paper about the final departure from Rockland on the last day of this of the passenger service. So it's sort of been neat to see his handwriting there. And as I was looking for him, go to the next one, I was even able to find a picture of our of our fine Captain Raleigh here, looking quite the respectable mariner. And it's been really neat to be able to have access to the museum's catalog collections while I was working. So I could have a window open in another screen and be running all these names through the database and see what I could find to sort of flesh out the, flesh out the details of what I was looking at as I went along. And the most colorful character I encountered is, uh, is George A. Nichols. And he, I have a soft spot for Captain Nichols because his charts were the most fun of any of the ones I encountered. This guy, this one here, he, he's, he's got this rather effusive dedication where he, this is a South Pacific chart from 1868 and it's covered in tracks for the vessel at, for, um, the ship Abner Coburn. And he writes, January 1st, 1884, this chart was given to me by my best friend. Yes, I may say by deeds done by him, Phineas Pendleton Jr. is every inch a man and he knows it. He can feel for another and he has shown it by me, George Nichols, ship Abner Coburn. But you can see that Phineas Pendleton has been scratched out. So you don't know if uh, perhaps the other captain was embarrassed by all this enthusiasm or maybe they had a follow falling out. If you go to the next one here, this is this is what George Nichols looks like, rocking a fine pair of mutton chops. And uh, we don't know anything more about the friendship between George Nichols and Phineas Pendleton, but it is worth mentioning that the last ship George Nichols captained before he went back to the Abner Coburn was named the Phineas Pendleton. So these guys clearly were professional co-workers and comrades and apparently friends as well. But Ab uh, uh, George Nichols charts are, the most entertaining because they're the most colorful in the language and the annotations. Here you can see he's talking smack about a boarding house in Anger in the Philippines or in, in, this, in Southeast Asia. The Siegler Van Stratton's house is not great. It's too loud. I'll let you read what he, what he actually says. He's the only chart I, he, he's the only uh, person I found whose charts contain profanity. <laughs> he wrote bad language on a bunch of them, often cursing out the weather, uh, the weather conditions. I see we have a comment asking about where Phineas Pendleton was from. He's a Searsport uh, mariner, although I think he also had shipping interests in New York or Boston, but he's part of the big Searsport family of the Pendletons. But 
yeah, George, George, George Nichols was always a hoot because he's got that very distinctive sort of quick scribble. And it's whenever I whenever I handled a chart that had his writing on it, I knew to look at it closely because he must have had ADD. These charts are filled, his charts particularly, are filled with doodles and half-written log entries and like math notes and all sorts of stuff. So they're, they're pretty fun. Yeah, people definitely swore back then, especially mariners, I might add. <laughs> There's a fine tradition for salty language. Some charts were not quite so obvious in the stories they were gonna tell. It took me a while to figure out what this little detail said. This is, a, this is a large scale ocean chart. And eventually I was able to figure out, it says Tommy died January 8th, 1876, 90 days, 90 days out from the previous port. Um, I was able to look at a demo, the corner of this chart, which is a deep, next slide here. The next slide has, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, another image of that same chart that has the Tommy died. I was able to look back and see that whoever owned that chart was really good about writing what vessels they were on. And so by getting a list of vessels, I could then sort of figure out who the captain might've been. And in this case, I was able to figure out that it was a voyage from San Francisco to Liverpool that had departed October, 1875 from the glory of the seas. Glory And glory of the seas is one of the famous uh, clipper ships. She was the very last clipper ship designed by the famous architect Donald McKay. And she was launched in 1869 and set records for her speed until finally she became obsolete and was burned for her iron in the 1920s, which is a shame. But the captain uh, in 1876, the time of our note, was a guy named Josiah Nickerson Knowles, and he had command of glory during that time. And I was able to confirm through running, looking through genealogy databases that Josiah Nickerson Knowles did have a son named Thomas who had died at sea on January 8th, 1876. And they had brought the tiny body back to New Bedford for burial. So uh, it's just, it's really interesting when you can put stuff together. Uh, the glory of the seas voyage that I just talked about was going from San Francisco to Liverpool. So he was on his, they, they rounded, you can see Falkland Islands here, so they'd gone around the Horn and they were on their way homeward bound, uh, or at least back into the Atlantic. And around Cape Horn is where a lot of the charts really go haywire. You can see in the red lines on this chart that they got, that they were getting whacked around by weather for several days off Cape Horn. The, the seas are notoriously bad. And this was often an area where vessels got into distress. As you can see here, that little note took off the crew of the Charles Dennis. And this chart belonged to a vessel named Belle of Bath. And Belle of Bath was on a routine trip from Portland, Oregon to have to La Havre, France in September of 1891 when they spotted the three-masted ship Charles Dennis in distress off Cape Horn. And she was very low in the water and signaling for assistance in a heavy gale. And Captain Curtis of the Belle of Bath was able to get a small boat launched from his own vessel. And under pretty arduous conditions, he, made, he managed to get row over to the Charles Dennis where he succeeded in rescuing everybody aboard as they were about to drop. And the crew of the Dennis told a pretty familiar story for this area of the ocean. They'd sailed from New York on June 6 with a cargo of coal heading for San Francisco. And they'd arrived off Cape Horn in mid-August and battled severe weather for two weeks. And in all that pounding, the heavy seas had worked her seams open. So she began taking on water pretty badly. And despite the crew's best interest, they weren't able to keep ahead of it. And unfortunately, the donkey engine, which is the mechanical engine that some of these vessels carried for auxiliary power, uh, which they were using to run the bilge pumps at this point, the, the donkey engine broke down and the sailors were not able to keep up with the rising water in their hold. And fortunately, just as the Dennis was really starting to get into sort of a point of no return is when Belle of Bath showed up and was able to rescue them. And they carried the rescued sailors on to Rio de, to Rio de Janeiro and put, them on, and, and put them ashore there. But one man, one of the, carpent, the ship's carpenter from the Dennis was so grateful to the Belle of Bath, he refused to be put ashore and stayed on working with Captain Curtis uh, 20 years later. I was able to find an article about that in a newspaper uh, published in 1904 when this, car this, this carpenter was interviewed and was still swore up and down years later that the, that the captain of the Belle of Bath had saved his life. And that's why he was going to sail with him till he no longer wanted to sail. So it's really been neat just, just from that little tiny blurb on a chart to just run, run, run some of these keywords through the other databases and see what, what stories are, are concealed in just one tiny little doodle. The most exciting captain for me personally uh, was 
this guy here, Lincoln Colcord, that sort of as, as I was finishing up going through the chart room, there was one box of charts left at the very back that I figured I would get to at the end if I had time. And thank God I did, because all of the charts in this box had belonged to Lincoln Colcord, who was one of the very famous uh, main skippers, whose name I'd, act I'd known before taking this project. So it was a real treat to get to handle his charts. This picture here was taken by his daughter, Joanna, when she was 12 or 13. As she would sail, she, she and her family sailed with Captain Colcord there. And Joanna was interested in photography. But apparently, when, apparently when Mrs. Captain Colcord saw this photo, she was rather put out that Lincoln was not wearing his false teeth in this photo. <laughs> Otherwise it was a good picture, but, he, but you can see by his squinting aloft there with his open mouth, he's not wearing his false teeth and that made his wife mad <laughs> for this photo. But his wife was really important to him. In fact, Lincoln Colcord writes a lot of his chart details about his family. Uh, for instance, here, you, see, you can see right in the middle, wedding voyage in Littlefield. Lincoln Colcord first shipped out in 1881 aboard his uncle's bark, the Charlotte A. Littlefield. And he became captain of that vessel when he was 22. And three years later, he got married and took his new bride, Jenny Sweetser Colcord, out to sea with him. And they had two kids born during that first trip, which I think lasted something like three years. So uh, quite the long honeymoon. You've got to be, yeah, I guess that's a, a honeymoon like that is a, is a make or break affair for a marriage, I would say. But it apparently made it and they, they were quite devoted to each other. In fact, so much so that the next slide, when I was going through his charts, I kept seeing all of these charts that had a red line that were labeled the Lonesome Voyage. And I did some snooping around on that, read, read up a few, there's a book of the Colcord letters and I was able to look it up and find that uh, Jenny Sweetser Colcord has sailed with her husband most of, her, most of his voyages, but later in their marriage, she started just wanting to spend some time ashore. And she, yeah, she'd gone for 10 out of 16 voyages in just a decade. And in 1902, she wrote to her son, as much as I dislike and dread the sea life, still I shall be greatly disappointed if Papa has to go away alone once more. I know how utterly miserable he has been most of this voyage sailing alone. You can see that uh, Lincoln confirms it. He writes the lonesome voyage. He's heading he, on this one, he's heading up into India to one of the rice ports where he spends three months and then writes again on the outward leg. The lonesome voyage continues these three months later. So halfway a world off, uh, ha ha half a world away, he, Lincoln is still thinking about his wife. So that's sort of a, a neat love story spread across half a dozen charts from a century ago. And Lincoln Colcord, also is interesting for sort of the little details he puts on his chart, like this one here. This is off uh, Papua New Guinea. This is a Pacific chart from 1879, where Lincoln Colcord writes that the natives came alongside, exchanged tobacco for fruit. King Matty was in the canoe and I was embraced by him. I, I, I really was struck by how honest that, like it, it doesn't sound terribly condescending, which for, a late 19th century mariner dealing with indigenous peoples is sort of refreshing that this, 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 it doesn't terribly, it doesn't sound, um, it sounds, it, it sounds like a fairly respectful exchange, which was nice to see. And it's also just neat to see an encounter between, uh, between Westerners and indigenous peoples and going off smoothly at this time. So, these charts also show their own physical history along the way. This is another one of Lincoln Colcord's charts. And that was the first step with some of these charts was just putting them back together because these things, they're working documents. These things were carried at sea and survived shipwreck and rats and water damage. And sometimes they got cut up for souvenirs like this one here, it's torn up in pieces, but also some pieces were cut out and maybe framed or used for other purposes. It's a little challenging. Um, other charts, like this next one here, there were a whole, there was probably half a dozen charts that had survived fire. Uh, this one here has been charred pretty badly and it's very brittle and crumbling, but I don't know what the story is on that. It's, it's, it's tempting to imagine like somebody running back into the, running, running back into a pilot house and grabbing a bag, but who knows, this could have been somebody's barn fire 30 years ago, but it's, it's still interesting to see that these late 19th century charts survived this fire and were, were still intact. Yeah, fingerprints. That, that's the other thing that's really, the, the literal touch of the past is a lot of these charts 
show that pe people were handling them. You can see fingerprints done, and you can see coffee stains and salt water and bird droppings and oil and in cases where somebody was painting or tarring aloft and suddenly tar gets spilled, uh, gets spilled down on things. But seeing those fingerprints really is, is the tangible connection to the past that you see that another person was holding this chart just like I'm holding this chart. They're also repairing these charts as they get patched, as they get damaged. And that was another delightful, uh, delightfully unexpected sort of personal touch because these charts with, these, with the patches, this is often one of the small ways that you can see whether these, whether these vessels had families aboard because a lot of these textiles, you can see on the left here that these charts are edged in pretty, pretty bright uh, domestic civilian uh, cotton printed cloth, often recycled from garments. I found a bunch of these that had uh, that had visible seams where they were being cut out of shirts or being cut out of um, out of other garments and recycled. And that's probably the work of women aboard that sort of brightly colored fabric who might have been carrying uh, material to to be mending clothes for the families because you've got kids growing up on these boats as well. And you also see just a tendency to use what is at hand. For instance, this is actually another one of George Nichols's charts that he patched on the back with a California flower sack to help keep that bag intact. And that's a pretty big piece of cloth. It's hard to tell in the picture, but it's like 18 inches across. It's a, it's a pretty good size piece of cloth holding that together. So kind of nifty, I thought. <clears throat> and the next one, this, yeah, they, this is uh, this chart here is an 1869 edition of the James Imray chart of Australia and the adjacent islands. And it belonged to Captain Amos Nichols. You can see he's patched it here with some twine. There's some tape on it. There's this really garish striped fabric. The, the, um, the pink fabric there, that sort of ripple effect you see on the sides is printed on the cloth. And I guarantee you it is a just as garish a Pepto-Bismol color in person as it looks on your screen. So when next time you pick, next time you see some sepia photo of somebody dressed all in what looks like black and white, imagine it in that garish pink because they, they had some really bright colors back then too. Um, but Amos Nichols was born in Searsport in 1860, and he served as postmaster for the town once he retired from uh, of Searsport, once he retired from the maritime world. And he died at the age of 90 in 1850. And the thing that kept coming to mind as I was holding this chart, you can see the coast of New Zealand there, is it's, it's kind of amazing to think about what the world would have looked like in 1950 to a man who had sailed to China and New Zealand as a 24 year old sea captain in the 1880s. It's a really, really astounding leap of, of, uh, of what this guy would have seen of sort of how the world had changed between his childhood and his old age. And the next one here, uh, sometimes the patches were almost more interesting than the charts themselves. This is a map of the China Sea from 1821 that has been patched on the reverse here with uh, used logbook pages dating about 1833. It's kind of hard to, unfortunately, it's, it's really hard to read and it was it's very hard to read in person too. But I was, able, I was able to make out a few lines where they, they reference talking to the brig favorite en route from New York to Baltimore, uh, New York to Honduras and the schooner Peter Francisco from Ocracoke for New York. And one visible entry reads that they broke out the lumber in the steerage and got up some water at eight. Strong gale and frequent heavy squalls with large and confused sea. The ship is off course laboring violently. It's like you, you can sort of picture, see they were, they, were, they were having some trouble in bad weather at that point. And the other, the other piece of paper up there, uh, is a patch of newspaper from May 17th, 1833. Sorry about the background noise. I'm, I'm in my local fire station, so you may hear the, the you may hear noise in the background, um, but they have the best Wi-Fi, so that's why I'm here. But uh, yeah, I don't know what that newspaper is besides the generic title of Courier and Inquirer, but it's really neat to see the, this, just this recycled ephemera being, being used in other charts. This log book is long gone, but this one page out of it still exists. We don't know what vessel it was from. And the other thing is the bookseller marks themselves. Like on these charts, you often see, uh, see, see we have leopard prints. Uh, I didn't get a picture of it in this slide, but I actually did see one chart that was backed with a mar maroon and leopard print striped fabric dating probably about 1860 to 1880. So next time you think leopard prints is like, is, is the domain of the 1880s, 
think it, think think back a bit further. They had just as ugly fabrics back then, I promise. Uh, but this here is a bookseller's mark, uh, bookseller's sticker on the back of one of the charts from a chandlery in Boston, yeah, corner of Richmond Street. And it's just, it's interesting to see the artwork they're putting on these things for just a little promo sticker on the back, a beautiful little drawing of the building there. And that, that whole drawing is only about an inch or two across. So quite the level of detail to get into this. And I always have the same problem when I see these chandlery marks that I do whenever I go down to Mystic Seaport or any other like recreated village stores. I just want them to take my money. I want to buy the stuff on the shelves. <laughs> I don't care if it's a re if it's a reproductive store. I want to I want to I want to I want the stuff. And then the next one actually has an even better one. Uh, Stationers Hall here. Uh, yeah, again, a very, very elaborate an elaborately drawn thing, but I, one of, what I thought was particularly neat, aside from that really sort of Dickensian looking storefront there, is they list practically the whole catalog of stuff they have at this ship, ship chandlery. Uh, everything from navigation books to cutlery to ink powder to first aid kits, all sorts of things, which really does make sense because if you think about it, a lot of these early um, a lot of these voyages that are going uh, out across or around Cape Horn or out to Asia, these things, this is almost like the lunar landings of their day. Like you, when you when you depart, you better have everything you need for at least six to eight months or better yet a year, because you don't know if you're going to be able to reprovision in some tiny little island in the South Pacific. So you, so these, these chandlers really carried everything. And yeah, ships were floating cities and they were very self-sufficient. And yeah, as far as, yeah, my, my project going through these charts for identifying all this stuff and updating our computer records in, so that it would be easier to get at these things for future researchers. Because when I took this project, there was a lot, there, there had been a couple of updates in the systems that had some duplicates. And it was, and also nobody had gone through and tracked down all the annotations on these charts, which hopefully this stuff will be able to be added into our system. So if someone comes in and wants to look up a specific ship, you can. But also in like this one here, Briggs Surprise, C.A. Homan's Master. And this chart really jumped out at me because see all those little arrows along the bottom edge there? This guy, this is the one chart in this entire collection where this guy was recording his web, his current and wind observations using the standardized meteorological uh, number, the, the, the arrow system with all the, the fletchings indicating the, the, um, the speed and direction that this guy took a lot of notes. And it's, he's not the only one though. A lot of these charts have what what direction the wind was coming from on any given day, how bad it was, whether it was raining or not. Could you see icebergs? And these voyage track records will be really useful for future researchers who wanna maybe track climate change studies because you've got 200 years of, obser of weather observations on these charts. Um, the, what, the recorded weather conditions can be compared to current meteorological data. And it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a very good data point to be able to plug in and expand our, sis, our knowledge of a region over time. And um, in a related vein, the charts from fishing and whaling voyages on the next slide here are uh, useful for studying ocean health and how the changing ecosystems have, have risen and fallen and, or collapsed in some cases over the last few centuries. This here is a whaler's chart put out in 1851. And it gives the species of whales and how like, in like the most commonly hunted varieties, but as well as which parts of the ocean they were commonly seen in and what time of year. So if you're some New Bedford whaler or a Nantucket whaler captain and you are heading out across the world, this gives you an idea of if you know you're gonna arrive say off Alaska in March, do you wanna be there or do you wanna head down to maybe there's more whales off Hawaii at that, that time of year? And from this chart from 1850, it gives you an idea of what, what the whale population looked like at that point. And unfortunately it's all it's often being recorded as these whales are being removed from the population, but it does give you a data point where you can look at whales nowadays and see, have they changed migration patterns? Did, did perhaps did hunting pressure cause them to change where they were going over the last hundred years? We don't, th th this sort of material gives more, gives uh, some data to work with for tracking these trends over time. 
And also all this travel data of all these voyages, 90 days out to Singapore with cargo of whatever, uh, this, all this travel data is, is, could be of interest to people who are studying the rise of international trade on a global market. Because the other thing is that, that we kind of forget is a lot of the early charts before the governments got involved in producing like naval charts, a lot of these charts are being privately financed by shipping companies and trading companies. Yeah, here right here we see to the honorable, the court of directors of the United East India Company. If, you, if you're familiar with any of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, the East India Company, it's usually listed as, it's usually the bad guys. Um, but uh, the East India Company was sending ships all the way around the world. And this here is, I wanna say like an 1840s chart. It's a surprisingly early chart to be seeing the Horn of Africa, that's modern day Somalia on a chart. And it's being put there by an English shipping company who are trying to give uh, their mariners an advantage to get out to these new markets to buy spices and cotton and rice and uh, all the other things that were being exchanged around the world at the time. And uh, the other thing is, Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Um, being able to do, being able to do this work in conjunctions with the really lovely collections of the Penobscot Marine Museum means that as I've been going along on this project, I've been able to integrate these charts with other resources like log books and photographs and collections. Uh, for instance, here you can see Bart. You can see the stained glass window on the back in the back wall. There it says Harvard. That's uh, one of Lincoln Colcord's ships. That uh, this is an image of. This is, this is an image of, of a below decks accommodations on, on the bark Harvard. And it's kind of neat because it looks very much like a fairly comfortable Victorian home. There are other photos from Lincoln Colcord's vessels. Uh, this is another one of Harvard. And you can see the nice built-in storage under the bunk there, pretty comfortable. He's also got his family aboard, like I, like I said earlier, including his young daughter, Joanna, who in the next slide, not only did she draw pictures, she or not only did she take pictures, she drew pictures. And this is one of her sketches of below decks accommodations. So it's been really interesting to be able to not only put vessels to these charts, but put captains faces to these charts and then put their families faces to these charts and sort of look at these positions in a more, um, in a more cohesive, expanded worldview, sort of see the context for these things. It's been really interesting to do that project and to be able to, to link these charts that these are not just static pieces of paper. These are documents that can help us expand the storytelling capacity because at the end of the day, history is all about telling a good story uh, and that these people were, were seeking their jobs around the world, but also seeking adventure and exploring new places. And sometimes they didn't come home, but there's really cool stories that you can tell out of these charts. And just in closing, I can't, <laughs> I can't end this program without a little bit of bragging. This is what the chart room looked like when I got here because we had a whole bunch of charts that had not been a session. There was a bunch of loose charts on top that needed to be organized and put away. And so that's what it looked like. And the next slide is after I'd finished doing all my cataloging. <laughs> so I'm really proud of that because if anybody, <laughs> if anybody knows, it can be very hard to uh, find, <laughs> find homes for that many things but it was all successfully done. So anyways, yeah, the, 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 there's about 3,500 charts in the collection. We're updating the computer records right now so that these will be more accessible to visitors to uh, get to come in and look up specific things. So you, and like, I highly recommend if you, if you have a favorite seacoast town or community, come in and, see, and like ask to see what, they, what it looked like 100 years ago, because it's, it's been pretty nifty to see how these areas, as the sand dunes move or the villages settle or the villages go away. So just come see if you've got your own hometown. That's kind of neat. But I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. This has, been a, this has been your somewhat guided tour of the Penobscot Marine Museum chart collections. We've had great conversation going on in the chat, but I don't think we have any questions that we haven't answered yet. So this is your chance, everybody. Type in your questions so we can pose them to Sarah. I'll also add while we're waiting, if you're interested in the stories of the Searsport Sea Captains, I encourage you to visit the museum this summer. We have guided tours of the Fowler II Ross House, which focuses on the stories of the sea captains and their families' experiences at sea as well.